great to, it's a great honor to be here, it really is. Um, so my career started out when I was about 11 years old, I think. I, as Jeff told you, that I just loved monster movies. And of course, I, I, I coerced my sister to stay up late with me because I was scared of watching monster movies. <laughs> Uh, to watch those monster movies with me. And uh, I was just fascinated by how the actor changed into different characters and how the makeup helped them become the character. And um, um, when I was, uh, I guess, about 11 or 12 years old, uh, I just started reading books about makeup. The first one I picked up was Richard Corson's stage makeup book. And it, there was so much information in there. I think I read it from front to back immediately, you know, and trying everything that they had in there. And uh, as I grew up, I, I had other interests, but I always came back to makeup. And in 1972, uh, Planet of the Apes had already come out in 1968. And after uh, Seven Faces of Dr. Lau, I immediately um, saw, in 1968, Planet of the Apes, and that was all she wrote. I was, I was hooked on makeup. So, so I decided to make myself up as an ape from Planet of the Apes. So I did, and I sent my picture in to Famous Monsters of Filmland, which was another big magazine that I'd always picked up. And, and about going back in about 1965, Dick Smith came out with how how to uh, 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 some some makeup book that how to make a monster. So um, I read that front and back, and I still have that issue, and it's just torn up and shredded because I was always going back to it and figuring out how to do things. So, in 1972, I made myself up as one of the apes, sculpted the whole thing, and, and, and made the prosthetics, made the wig myself out of crepe wool and rubber and, and everything, and laid it on my face, took pictures, and sent it in to Famous Monsters, and I was awarded a best, uh, mo uh, more readers needed like Matthew Mungo, <laughs> and I have a little picture in there. And, so I showed the picture to my friend, uh, Teresa Thompson, who was a classmate, and she said, you mind if I take this picture and show it to my father? Well, her father was the owner of the Thompson Theater in Atoka, Oklahoma. So um, uh, she showed it to him, and that night I got a call from him immediately. Uh, well, can you dress up on Saturday and come down and promote, uh, I think it was Battle for the Planet of the Apes, or Escape from the Planet of the Apes, one of those movies. And I said, well, uh, of course, yes. Uh, he said, I can pay you. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, oh, I get paid for this, wow. Um, so I made my, I got up real early in the morning because living on a farm with my parents and my, my four siblings, of course, you get up early in the morning anyway. So got up early up in the morning and put the makeup on and drove up to town. Of course, I got a lot of looks when I was driving up to 75 going to, into town. Um, knocked on the door of the theater. Of course, nobody downtown was sleepy at that point. You, know, or you have to understand uh, population 4,000 in Tokyo, Oklahoma at that time. And this was the only movie theater in town. And uh, knocked on the door. Uh, John Thompson came to the, comes to the door, opens the door, and she goes, Oh, uh, yeah, you really did it. So <laughs> had, uh, I had over orange overalls on, which was the, the kind of theme for the movie. And, uh, and the, made up my hands and my face and everything. He said, come on in. I talked to him a little bit. Uh, and he had made a sign for me to carry around uh, the, the town. So I carried around that all day and promoted the show. Didn't talk to anyone just grunted and made, made chimpanzee sounds. <laughs> Nobody knew who I was. Nobody knew who I was. And that was the instant that I figured out, I can do this, and I can act too, and I can create these characters. 
Uh, and it was just amazing to me. Of course, I kept it on all night. Nobody knew who it was except for Teresa, of course, and my good friends in, in high school. And I, I think I took it off at 11 or 12 that night because I just had it on all night. And I get, he presented me with a check for $15. And I, oh, I can get paid for doing this too. So, oh, okay, well, all right, well, that's good. So I really had a passion for doing makeup. And uh, after high school, I graduated and went to OSU. And uh, I was immediately pulled into the theater department. I knew I wanted to uh, be in the theater department. So I was immediately pulled in there by uh, Jerry Davis and, and uh, uh, Dr. Cox and uh, Vivian Locke and all of the people who were at OSU at the time because I had this great portfolio of costumes I had done over the years at the Thompson Theater to promote things, like Winnie the Pooh. And, you know, besides doing makeup, I was doing costumes. Anything I could do to immerse myself in that. And they put me to work immediately doing props and costumes and everything. And that was wonderful. And that was for two years at Oklahoma State University. Then after that, that summer of 1977, I went to, I moved to Houston, Texas. And I always wanted to work at amusement parks. I worked at Astral World. It had nothing to do with makeup. But of course, that year, Memorial Day weekend, a little film called Star Wars came out. And uh, during the summer, they had a, a, a convention, a science convention sci-fi sci convention, and uh, Rick Baker was going to be there. Of course, he was, I, I, you know, I idolized Rick because he started out doing exactly what I did, making himself up and doing all this stuff, and he worked on Star Wars, so he, so he was going around. So I met him at the convention, I showed him my portfolio, I said, well, I'm going out, I don't want to go out to Hollywood and, and go to makeup school, uh, this one school, and he said, no, don't go to that school, go to Joe Blasco Makeup Center. Well, I was on cloud nine after meeting him, so I immediately ran out of the auditorium and called, uh, called Joe Blasco Makeup Center and tried to enroll and get all the information from them So, because I knew I was going to move to Hollywood. And then, end of the summer came, I had to go back to OSU. I called my brother, Mason, who's here, uh, actually crying, going, I, you know, I can't do this anymore here at OSU, I really want to go to Hollywood and do this. So he said, well, let me talk to Dad, and, uh, and I'll, I'll talk to Dad and, and ask him about it. So Dad called me and said, okay, I, now I'm going to make you a deal. I'm going to, uh, you go the rest of the semester, and you can move to Hollywood in December. I said, okay. Needless to say, going to school at OSU that semester, I made all Fs oh. in class, because I didn't want to be there. I was already in Hollywood. So, in December of 77, packed my car, not knowing a single soul in Hollywood, in Los Angeles, but had been enrolled in Joe Blasco Makeup Center. Drove out there, stayed at the Holiday Inn or whatever, got an apartment the next day, and I was off. Uh, went to the school. It was the first time in my life that I had ever soaked everything up that was taught there like a sponge because I wanted to know this. I wanted to, I wanted to immerse myself in makeup. And that's, that's what it's all about, about doing anything in your life, is having a passion for it. And uh, so I graduated from that, uh, the school. I started teaching there. I then was re uh, referred to jobs, and it just started snowballing. I got involved with uh, film students at UCLA who were trying to put a little film together on their own through the school, but yet they had uh, 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 a, a desire to release that film, which after that they changed all the rules at UCLA uh, after they did that. But we got together and I just did makeup for them, for, for movies. And the first movie that we did was The Dorm That Drip Blood. Slasher film, just anything I could do, and I, you know, uh, oh, you're going to pay me this? Okay, that's great. <laughs> just because I wanted to do it. So, and and that led to another uh, four years with them doing a movie called The Kindred, The Power, 
uh, and other films, just doing bigger and better makeup effects. Um, and then after that, I really wanted to get into the union, but uh, it was really hard at that time. It's not as easy as it is now, um, which is it's still hard. Um, but just to make ends meet, I would go and work at CBS and NBC on soap operas doing regular makeup. Anything that was, and uh, Joe Blasco always told me when I was going to the school, your bread and butter right now will be beauty makeup. And if you know beauty makeup, then you can go anywhere with that because of the highlight shadow and everything else. Of course, I had learned everything from ball caps, to beards, to prosthetics, which I already knew how to do. So I just learned other techniques from everybody. And so I just started doing beauty makeup. So I'm, soap operas and anything I could do, you know, the news or whatever, but at the same time going home and sculpting and making molds and, and working on my own. Um, and so then after that, uh, I started working on uh, department heading shows such as uh, uh, War Party and Split Decision and then Navy Seals came up, which was a bigger movie and I met a producer and was always working for him on, on things because we got along well. And that was the thing about myself. I was always, whatever you need, you know, I, I can do it. Prosthetics, beauty makeup, whatever. Just anything for the production. You don't have to go to somebody else. I can do it all for you uh, as far as that's concerned. Of course, we had our own hair department and everything. And that's another thing is just making yourself available uh, as far as work is concerned. And um, so Navy Seals came about, and that was in 90, uh, 89. And then another little film came about, and Vimeo called me and wanted me to work with her on Edward Scissorhands. So I flew to uh, Tampa, Florida, and worked on Edward Scissorhands. But in the meantime, I had to fly back to LA, take my union test, to be unionized during the, the weekend, and then flew back and finished out Edward Scissorhands there. And that was great, because V and I was, were doing uh, um, uh, at, uh, Johnny Depp's makeup on every day. And then uh, it just started snowballing from there, you know, working on television, films, anything I could do to do my profession. Um, and then uh, worked with Oliver Stone on Heaven and Earth. Um, and after that, he asked me to do Natural Born Killers. Um, I did Natural Born Killers. It just about killed me on Natural Born Killers. <laughs> because it was just so intense and uh, it was it was hard working with Oliver on heaven and earth but we got along really well on natural born killers I came in the first week he said he looks at me and said Matthew you know what I want on this film I looked at him and I said Oliver I have no idea what you want <laughs> you know because it's a complete departure of what it's just all over the place you know at first I didn't want to do the film because it was so bloody you know, coming from blood and gore, I did it was just so bloody. But uh, I was convinced that it was it was the way society and the media looks at serial killers and glorifies them. So I I went into it that way, you know, just to to work on it. So got through with that. After that film, I decided, you know, I don't want a department head shows anymore. I want to do makeup effects. I want to do molding. I want to do uh, everything in, in, in involved in makeup effects. So I decided to open my own lab and that way I can get two or three jobs at the same time and keep my interest in everything. So uh, in rented an old building. Up until then I had everything in the house in my garage. You know, So every time I moved into a new house I'd go into the garage and completely redo it. And, and, and insulate it, put the lights in I needed as my little lab, but finally moved it out of the house and that was the best thing because I could go to work in the morning instead of go out the door and go into the garage. <laughs> so, uh, so I got that, started getting shows, you know, I was, I, my name was starting to get out there, I was reliable, and that's one of the things coming from Oklahoma and having the upbringing that, that I have had with my family, my mom and dad, is, is a work ethic. And it's very important to have a work ethic in this business. Uh, you, you're trustworthy, uh, you show up on time, you, you 
give them the budget and stay with that budget, they're going to ask you back. You know, they are going to ask you back unless they have another motive or something. But uh, that, that's really that was really important to me growing up and and in this business. And I think producers and directors saw that. And I, I worked with Frank Oz on about seven productions. Bernie Williams, a producer on at least eight productions. So it's it's a matter of of, of earning their trust and listening to what they want to. And uh, so in 93, I did a film called uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, which was uh, great. Uh, Greg Canham had hired me on to do the application on the show. And uh, I got into it and started making all the teeth for all the, the vampires on the film. And then, then also applying all the uh, Gary Oldman's prosthetics every day that he worked in prosthetics. And that was a great show because it was, Gary was just amazing with us. With production, he wasn't, not so much, uh, because of course he had to get into that old age makeup every day that he worked in it. And there was one day we put him in makeup, and I think they had him sitting around four hours after we finished the makeup. So he went into the, the first AD, kind of, I kind of followed him in, you know, just stood back and just kind of, what's going on here? He goes up to the, the first AD, and of course he has these finger extensions on his, four fingers on each finger. And he goes up to the AD and he said, if you're not going to use me now, I'm not going to stay in this makeup. Thus pulling off all of his finger extensions and throwing them on the ground and walking out. You know, because he was in the makeup for four hours. You have to realize this is a full prosthetic makeup and everything. So the little PA goes and picks all of those <laughs> pieces up and comes back to the trailer, opens, knocks on the door. Matthew, are you in there? Oh, I open the door. He says, can you put these back on Gary? <laughs> I said, oh, OK, we'll do it. So we pulled out new pieces and put them on. But it's just working with the actors and the, ADs as far as that's concerned. And then um, uh, from there it just led to Ghost of Mississippi, which I wanted to try gelatin on. On um, uh, Oh, before that was uh, Schindler's List, which I was asked to do ball caps on actresses. And of course, Steven Spielberg wanted to shoot all around them in the uh, shower scenes. And up until then, ball caps had been done where the uh, the ball cap comes way down in the neck, and every time you turn the neck, you saw the wrinkles. Well, I, I was approached to do this, and in order to do that, I thought, well, we can just put the ball cap on in the very back and end it, cut a little groove in their hair and end it and glue it down to their, into their hair the ball cap, and that way you don't have anything on the neck, and then put the wig over it, which they, which they had to be shaved anyway, and cut all the hair short back right there, and it worked really great. But, but of course, being black and white film, we're all used to color film. We had to re-educate ourselves of what color to use for different colors. So we got the, the color chart, color and black and white and go, okay, red is this color when it comes out and a deeper red is this color, green is this color. So we decided what we needed to use as far as that's concerned. As far as the wig was concerned, we first tried the normal wig that you would, uh, that, that the wig maker would make, tying the hairs into the lace. And we decided it, it, it was just wrong. We didn't even show it to Steven Spielberg because we knew it was wrong. Because when you tie the knots in lace, you have that little knot down at the lace and it's dark. Well, in black and white, it amplified it 100%. So what, uh, what we went back to the wig maker and said, okay, what we need to do is you need to tie blonde hair into the wig and then go and color the hair on the top. Thus, you will not see the knot in the lace. So, and that worked out brilliant. And of course, cutting the lace back as far as we could in the front and putting it on. It wasn't HD at that time, it was still film, thank goodness. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it worked out really great. And then, uh, then Ghost of Mississippi came up and gelatin, 
up until then, old, old age had been done with foam latex. And I thought, I was always playing with gelatin, and it was nice and translucent, and it looked like skin. It had that semi-translucent uh, look of skin once you painted it. So I thought, oh, this would be great for an old age. So that, uh, that, that opportunity came up to work with James Woods and do an old age, so I did all of the old age in gelatin. Of course, the first day that we shot was in Mississippi during March, but it was still kind of hot and humid. And as I didn't know at that time, uh, what melts gelatin is the perspiration in the skin. So we, he's talking on camera, and I'm looking through the camera, and I'm seeing these little holes start down in here and here, and I was like, oh no. So I went up and I just kind of touched it, and it was just goo. And I go to Rob Reiner, who was shooting the film, and I said, we've got to get this right now, otherwise I'm going to have to redo the whole thing. So they got, they got what they needed to do, and I, I re-educated myself immediately to do changes and make it work. Uh, for that shooting. Of course, we moved back to Culver City in Los Angeles and finished everything inside, which was perfect. But I got through that, and it was a great rediscovery of gelatin, which they used in the movies years, for years, before they, uh, before they started using foam latex on Wizard of Oz. And they would just, it wouldn't work, gelatin wouldn't work, because the lights were too hot in the 30s for film. Um, so uh, Ghost of Mississippi came up, and then um, and then cut to Albert Knobs, and we used silicone on uh, for the nose. And those are things I love to do: is is things that you look at, and makeups you look at on actors, and you go, oh, they look different, but there's something I don't know what it is, and we put a nose on or something. That's where I get the biggest kick out of doing makeup. Is is looking, uh, making things look as realistic as possible, and you guessing what, what I put on. So uh, that was Albert Knobs, and then uh, today we're working on uh, uh, CSI and NCIS. We've been working on NCIS since the beginning, and that's a whole different genre of, of filmmaking is television, because it's done in seven or eight, uh, eight days on CSI and NCIS. Salem is shot in seven days which just makes everything tighter, you know, and the pre-production tighter. And uh, Salem we do in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, just finished that last week, or two weeks ago. And uh, it, it's, it's, been a, it's been a great ride, and I love what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So, you wanna come up? Yeah. And we'll do a little Q&A right now. Uh, With Tony Marlowe. <laughs> Um, I, Edward Scissorhands was one of those movies for me that, that definitely, like just, I was, I, I immediately noticed and, and it was definitely a pivotal point for me. Can you talk a little bit more about that being one of your first bigger films? Like, yeah, it any was. Any surprises that you were, because it was a bigger project. It was a great too. film to work on because it was lighthearted, it was fantasy, it was working with Tim Burton who has this great imagination about everything and of course his imagination is even grown over the years. But I was amazed at him because we were in Tampa, Florida, and he was always wearing black and long sleeve shirts, and we were always in shorts and everything. And it was, uh, he was just a great director. And uh, V had started the show out. Um, Stan Winston had made the hands and made the prosthetics, but V designed the makeup. And they were shooting for a week in, in um, Florida. And she decided she needed somebody to come and help her. So she gives me a call and I said, but yeah, of yeah. course, I'm working on something right now, but I can't leave it because I just had the last week and right. I need to go work with V on Edward Scissorhands. Of course I'm going to go. So I got on the plane and I was there on a Sunday and we started working on Monday. And it, it's interesting because she had Polaroids of Johnny's makeup and she had put all the, the scars on and she was taking the photo and trying to match that every day. I said, you know what, I've done this on, if I may uh, say something. Uh, I'm just, you know, I'm just uh, uh, you know I, I think
think we can improve this a little bit, uh, you know, with, why don't you ask Stan's crew to give us a um, vacuum form, which is just a, a very thin plastic of Johnny's face. And we can cut it in two and in half, so there's left and right, and cut it out as stencils. And that way we can put it on every morning, powder it, pull it off, and you see where all the cuts go, and they're there every time. And it, what do you think about that? Do you think that would work? <laughs> oh, that's a brilliant idea. Well, let's, let's do that. So, you know, so that worked out perfect. And it was, it cut the makeup time in half, and it was great. So I take one side of the face. She was a left-hand makeup artist. I was a right-hand makeup artist. So it worked out perfect. We were working on both sides, and we do that because we didn't have to do anything on his hands because he had the scissor hands. So uh, Stan Winston's uh, group took care of that. And it was just a really wonderful film to work on. It was yeah. just hot and really nice. <laughs> it's very good. Long sleeves. Yeah. <laughs> and is Tim Burton, is he heavily, is he very involved in the process of how the characters oh, look? Oh, very that, much so. So balancing what you think looks best versus what his vision is and then you doing your best judgment. I mean, is that hard to juggle and that's something that any makeup artist or any crew at all, you know, deals with is... They have what they have in their head. They, they right. say it a certain way. How do you interpret it? And Look, how do you give them the best option? The director is the captain of the ship, right. as far as I'm concerned, as far as anybody could, should be concerned. He is the captain of the ship. And he's the one that tells you what he wants, and you've got to listen to him. Of course, if they're a good director, any good director, you can suggest something and say, you know, I know you want to do it this way, but what if we do it this way? You're going to get the same result, but it's going to be faster for us to do the makeup, and it's going to give you a better result, you know. And, and it's going into the question of, uh, you know, not, not, you know, we got to do it this way, and it's going to be better. That's just going to put somebody on the wrong track. It's a matter of how you pose the question to the director or the producer of, of what you're going to do and what your vision of it is. And if they're a good director and they want to work with you, like Frank Oz was, and, and Tim Burton, um, they'll, they'll go with it. Okay, let's see it. Let's, let's go for it. Show me what you got. You know. So there you are. You're on stage at that point. Ready to go. They're ready to go. Do you have any questions out in the audience? Any questions? Yes? I have a question. Now that Tim Burton has been it's an honor having you here. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask you now, because of visual effects, how has that affected you in your career? Well, you know, when visual effects started in, the, in its infancy, we were, we were very worried about it. And at, at this point in my career, I'm not too worried about it because I'm older. And I, I started when visual effects we're just starting when makeup effects started, and that's when I started really doing makeup, which was great. But I think it's come to the point, of course, producers say, uh, you know, oh, we'll just do it with visual effects because it's cheaper. And yes, it may be cheaper, but you don't get the look you do with something tangible on an actor. And I've always not been scared of visual effects because when I started doing uh, Ed, um, uh, X Files on, for television on in '99, we were always doing practical effects and then being enhanced with visual effects, which always looked great, you know. And that gave me a chance to really work hand in hand with the visual effects department and going back and forth, okay, we can do this makeup, but you, you can enhance it a little bit with, with this. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. And also, some of the makeup effects people went into the visual effects world when it started. You know, I wasn't one of those because I, I, my, my <laughs> passion is for makeup, you know, for on, on a person. So, uh, I, I'm not really, scared of it now, especially for Salem. When I first went in for the interview, they said, okay, we want to do everything practical, as far as practical makeup, and then enhance it with visual effects. I said, I'm your man, I'm, you got me, I'm, if you want me, I'm, I'm here. 
So, and that's been really great because you'll you'll see your work up there, but they've enhanced it a little bit or put more blood in it or if for a throat slit, if they want a little bit more blood, blood, they'll put a little bit more blood in it or not in it at all and then put blood in it. So it's just a matter of working with it and, and not closing your mind to it and say, oh, yeah, it's going to take over. It's like, no, just go with the flow because everything's changing. All, every day it's changing. All the technology is changing. So if you don't adapt yourself, you're, then you're going to be a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. You might as well stop doing it. Well, thank you. Do you have to change your techniques, though? Yeah. Visual, you know, you lessen things or you add more, you know, knowing how it's going to... Well, well, that goes back to HD mm -hmm. because HD is so clear in right. 4K or whatever is coming out now. It's just so clear and crystal clear. You have to really, you can't get away with things you did on film. For instance, the butler. Uh, I didn't go into that. Uh, the butler, when we were doing tests on the butler and I walked in to the after we made up Forrest Whitaker on his oldest age and we walk in and I see it's a film camera and not an HD camera. I went up to the, uh, the DP and I said, thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> I'm so glad you're doing this, you know. Because yes, you can shoot it in HD and you can filter and you can clean it up, but film, there's nothing like film. Like the, it's the softness. The, yeah, exactly, for prosthetics. Um, but it goes back to to having to do your work a little bit more precise now with HD. And as far as visual effects, yes, we may have to enhance it a little bit more. But we do it. We do a makeup to the eye in the, tra the trailer as much as we can, and we'll we'll see it on the right. set, and then we'll adjust it if we need to, and we'll go up to the visual effects coordinator or supervisor who's ever on set and go, what do you think? Do we do, do you think we need to enhance this or you know put the dots on it or whatever? They don't use dots too much anymore. Hmm. They just do it you know, uh, it once they get it. Yeah. So it's it's just it really is a matter of working with your crew and working with people. Yeah. Did you have another of course, yeah, <laughs> I do. <Right>. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, time management has always been something that is, is hard, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. definitely dealing with film and TV, what are the big differences there and how do you, how do you juggle that? It's a big shift. Well, a film, you used to have a lot of pre-production time. Now it's not so much, uh, but you still have to get the work done. You know, you go to, you go to the producer and say, okay, I need a month to prep this. And you'll go, okay, you have two weeks to prep this. And I said, can I have three? And it's like a bargaining thing. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, on, for instance, on the, uh, the butler, um, I said, you know, I need two months prep. And they said, well, we're, f we're four weeks out from shooting. And I said, oh, okay, mm -hmm. you know, let's go for it. By the time we started, doing all our lab work, we had two weeks prep because we didn't get the actors in time. Mm -hmm. So two weeks prep, uh, luckily most of the old ages we, we were doing were spread out through the production of three months and we had time to catch up to that. But it, it's hard these days doing that. Now television is even worse, of course. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where my, my uh, profession and my my craft come, came in, and my and my education came in um, over the years uh, at Joe Blasco, and because he was always saying you can get, you don't have to mold something, you can do it on the set, you can take the wax out, or now it's silicone, and build it up on the set and do that, and that's really where uh, I, I really excel and doing things on the set fast. For, for especially television, for CSI, oh, you need a cut, oh, yeah, I'll just pull it on my bag and do it, you know. <laughs> I don't have to go back to the trail, I can do it here, you know. And that's going to get you more work, and that, they, they love us there, that's why we're going into our, their 15th season, my 10th season with the show, because it, it's, you know, it's go, it's go, you know. And it's, of course, eight days, uh, 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 we're just starting uh, our new season on Wednesday. And of course, we've had about a week and a half prep for that. 
course, you don't really get that right. when you start, when that train go, leaves the station. I, I kind of uh, equal it out to a train leaving a station at the beginning of a series and it just going and not stopping until April. You know? Right, right. So, so you have to get on that train and you have to go with it, otherwise you're going to be left behind. So it, it's a, it, it, we'll get the script, let's see. So on CSI, we, we start an episode, say we start an episode on Monday. We shoot for eight days, which is all that week, and then the next three days of the next week. After the first day of shooting on the episode, we'll get the script for the next show, uh, which is just the writer's draft. And we go through about three drafts of the, sh of the show. And we'll break that down, and uh, we'll go have a makeup meeting with the, with the uh, director about, uh, okay, you need this dead body, and, and you need to do an autopsy on them. Are we using a real person? Are we using a fake body? What do you have to do to them? Are they, are they missing a limb? And are, if they're missing a limb, are we doing a fake body? Or are we going to visually f affect, remove the, the arm? So we go through all of the just kind of concepts, how we're going to create an effect. And uh, once we get that, we break it down, I give them a budget, uh, we'll, we may have another meeting, but usually the next meeting is the day before we start shooting the episode. On the eighth day of that episode, we'll have a meeting for the next episode, um, a production meeting, where everybody gets together and puts their heads together, okay, we're going to go through this, we, we need to do this, and usually those meetings are about an hour, an hour and a half of the whole script, our script that we're doing. So, uh, and by then you've got it in your mind exactly what's going to do and, and, and when it's going to do. The best thing about television, I think, if, if you've got a really great first AD you can work with, you, you go up to him and say, okay, we can't have this effect ready until maybe later in the episode, uh, you know, the last day or the next to the last day, because it is a body, we have to cast the guy's head, we have to punch the hair and everything. Um, and, and they'll work with us. They'll, they'll say, okay, let me see if I can try that. But if an actor is not available at certain times, we have to, of course, we have to work longer hours and get it done. So it's just working with the crew, working with the producer, director. And if the director says, okay, I want it done this way, and he says, well, you know, that's going to cost a little bit more money and it's going to, and it's going to cost and it's going to take more time on the set. But if we do it this way, we can do it a certain, certain way. And, you know, it's just working with the director and the, the AD and the producers. Communication. Yes, communication. Communication. And, and as far as I'm concerned, you can't have enough meetings as far as prevention right. is concerned. You know, just to go over things. Some, some directors come in and say, well, I told you that. I said, well, sometimes it changes. This is Tell me again. <laughs> Stay calm. Let's, let's discuss this rationally. Yeah. You know? But most of our directors on CSI have just been with the show and know, oh, we can't do it this way, let's do it this way. Okay, great. Well, we, you know, and of course the first meeting is really grandioso stuff, you know, oh, let's do this. Let's do. And by the, you know, production meeting, it's cut down about half, you know, yeah, what we have to do. Yeah, time yeah. exactly. And, and speaking of communication, you, you are solely on special effects now, am I right? Mm -hmm. So you're stepping into a movie or to a series and you're having to walk into a team of other hair makeup and beauty. That's right. And right. normally a key makeup artist has a principal actor mm -hmm. and now you're stepping into it and you're now taking care of the principal actor as well. And how does that affect that communication process? Because you guys are kind of equal. No, absolutely. Authority. Absolutely. I think because I started out department heading, I know what that department head makeup artist is going through right. and having to deal with her or his his uh, actors. So I go in and I talk to the, the makeup artist and the hairstylist. I, I go in and introduce myself if we haven't met before and, and say, okay, let's, uh, so what do you want to do? Do you want to do that cut on them? Do you want to do that bruise? Or we can do it. So it's a matter of, again, communication mm -hmm. with the makeup artist, with the hairstylist and working as a team instead of, oh, I just do special effects and I've got my own thing and you've got your own thing and you right, stay away. Right. It's not that, it's a collaborative effort. Okay. Okay. 
I think we actually need to okay. go. Oh, we'll have one more question. Sorry, Justin. Tell us about the third person on stage. Is it between you guys? <laughs> I believe this is Kevin Farley from um, American Carol. He had to have a body done for him, so we, we cast his head like that, <laughs> sculpted the eye open. Uh, of course, what we do is we put the, the, uh, the either silicone or alginate on the face, and then right before it sets, we have it make that expression. <laughs> and, oh, wow. then, uh, uh, and, and then we get it done real fast. <laughs> and uh, get it off of him. And then once that's done, we pour it in uh, plaster and clean it up and then make another silicone mold of that and then pour it up in silicone. This is silicone and each hair is punched individually into the beard. And then this is a full uh, lace wig and then all of the hair around the hairline is punched uh, individually too. Wow. Wow. So it pretty much just makes itself. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody made this. And I have a team of artists who are wonderful, and you can't do it yourselves. You have to rely on them, too, and they're just really good. Well, can we have a quick round or a huge round of applause?